right into it. Right into it. That's right, because it is time. It's the Believe NFL live stream, week seven edition, the ultimate post game show. We're here every single Sunday at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. And we are ready to react to week seven of the NFL season because that's why the Believe Sports Network. It has 32 NFL podcasts with 32 former NFL players for every single team. And this show each week will feature our wildly talented and entertaining roster of co-hosts. So jump in the chat, comment, and toss a question below. Follow me on Twitter at Joey Sports Guy. Follow us on our main page at Believe Sports. And follow this gentleman right here because he's coming back. He's a returning co-host. He is the host of Believe in Steelers. He is fresh off the North Carolina State Fair. It is Mark Bergen himself. What's up, Mark? (laughs) Joey, how are you? And I see a twinkle in your eye because Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers got beat by the Washington Commanders. It is a great day. It's been an awesome weekend. And thank you for having me. Packers, Buccaneers, uh, it's already trending on Twitter. I don't know if you've seen it, but Aaron Rodgers is wearing some sort of robe of some kind. Um, Like appearing, it looks like he's just shuffling about his season right now. Uh, We're going to dive into that and so much more. But Mark, first, man. North Carolina State Fair, just tell me, favorite food, best food, good music? What's the what's the rating here? It was incredible. I didn't know what to expect. Best food, I'll go chicken on a stick. I was overwhelmed, and when I go again next year, I might give myself multiple days to be able to attend because if you only go for one day and I only had the chance to go one day this year, you there's so many options. It's just like, oh, I could get a turkey leg. I could get chicken on a stick. I could get burgers. I could get a steak sandwich get a chicken pita. I could get milk and cookies. I can get ice cream. It's whatever you want. You can get lobster. The North Carolina State Fair, huge, huge fan. North Carolina State Grounds. I had a fantastic time. So, oh, and free hush puppies as well. I'm burying the lead here. Jay. Now you so, got me. Yeah. Now you got me. Uh, you could. You can't do it all in one day. You can't eat it all in one day, I think is the message that we're trying to send out there, especially for patrons that want to attend it next year. Uh, we are live right now for Believe Livestream Week 7. Uh, well, let's just do some scores real quick. Uh, the Jets are hanging on right now. They're beating the Broncos 16-9. to The Seahawks, surprisingly, again, with the frustrating Chargers, what new? Water is wet, and the Chargers are frustrating again. They're losing 27 to 14. And the game that everyone's watching right now, the Chiefs are up 35 to 23 on the 49ers. Um, you, you hinted at it a little bit, Mark, but I just want to open it up to you. You know, what's your I got some themes that I want to talk about today. But right now, what's on the top of your mind in terms of the NFL action that you've watched today? If you're watching so far, Rodgers and Brady losing and Tom Brady and the Buccaneers, that people are going to be questioning come Monday. Is Brady over the hill at 45 years old? I don't think it's all on Tom Brady, but this offense is pretty anemic. Second time this season where they've been shut out in the first half. Only could muster three points against a Carolina Panthers team that is trying to tank following the trade with CMC to the 49ers. So having said all of that, the questions are going to be about Tom Brady really all this week because it's really not on Tom Brady. This is a Buccaneers team that point blank period cannot run the football And they got smoked by the Panthers today. I know it's a division matchup, but the Panthers aren't a very good football team. They're starting, what was it, the AAF's very own P.J. Walker at quarterback. XFL, XFL, baby. XFL MVP. So so that's really going to be the big storyline is Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because for back-to-back weeks now, they have not looked good at all. Yeah, and look, in regards to the Buccaneers, I, I don't know what the answer is right now because you're looking around the NFL. And my general thought right now is, you know, I want to reassess at Thanksgiving, but right now, in my opinion, the football across the board in the league is not very good. And I kind of want to make my case for that moving forward a little bit. And what you're seeing is a lot of football teams being able to run the football effectively. And you nailed it, Mark. If you're only getting 46 rushing yards a game, which they got today, only 46 with Tom Brady, who's averaging only 5.9 yards uh, yards per pass, uh, pass completion, you're going to have some huge problems. I saw Mike Evans wobbling around there a little bit. I don't think it's a weapons issue, and I'm with you. I don't know if it's a Tom Brady issue, but Aaron Rodgers, it's the same thing, man. They're dinking and dunking their way down the field, and it's almost like they have to be so perfect on these drives to score points, and in the end, it's kind of getting away from them a little bit, and they're both three and four right now. Which one do you think you're most – Which one can you be most optimistic about to turn it around? I would say the Packers just because in the NFC North division, I know the Vikings are having a nice season, but you're going to get wins against the Lions and the Bears right now. Like, let's just be frank with that. 
So I would go with the Packers, just given their history and the weakness in that division where the NFC South, I mean, you could make the same argument. Just with the Packers, they can run the ball. Aaron Jones and Tree Trunk Dillon in the backfield, I have a lot of faith in to be able to run the ball. So I would take the Packers over the Buccaneers there. And like the Buccaneers, like to me, it's as simple as this. I know they had a lot of players out, Akeem Hicks defensively, Cameron Brait, Julio Jones on the offensive side of the ball. But like, are Julio and Cameron Brait just simply so supposed to fix the Buccaneers' offensive problems? Like, how do you only <laughs> score three points in a game today against, again, a Carolina Panthers team by all stretches of the imagination are trying to tank to get a top draft pick in the 2023 draft? So, I, I don't know. Like, I never want to bet against Tom Brady, but at 45, again, this is what everyone's going to be talking about tonight and tomorrow. You're going to see by, by Tuesday and Wednesday, it's going to be like, should he retire midseason because we're going to run out of things to talk about. But I'm telling you right now, this is what people are going to be talking about this week is Tom Brady and the Buccaneers are not where they're supposed to be. And they got they got smoked today. I mean, I mean 21 to 3. I mean, again, this is a Panthers team that is not very good right now. Like the Panthers, I guess credit Steve Wilkes, the interim. I, I mean, there's a reason why Matt Rule was the first head coach fired in the league. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll land there. No, and, and look, man, you're right. But they were down 14 to nothing, the Buccaneers. They're in the red zone. They can't get it done on fourth down. And I'm with you. I don't want to count against Brady. I don't want to put my chips on. I'm not, I don't think Brady is going to succeed, but I just think the circumstances are a little bit different this year. We all know about the off field stuff, but let's just keep it on the field for a second. Yeah. And with, without that running game right now, you know that they're in trouble. And on top of that, usually what we've seen in seasons past is the Buccaneers can kind of go out and maybe not make a trade, but there's usually some sort of free agent that they're able to bring in to kind of rejuvenate and juice up their offense. And if you want to play the Odell Beckham sweepstakes, which our next guest in a couple of minutes is going to be coming in to talk a little bit about whether he could be a fit on the team that he yeah. covers. The Buccaneers now, I think, are a little bit less, uh, I don't know, I don't know how appealing it really is. Uh, Mark, I'll be honest with you, before we move on from the Buccaneers, I seriously had this thought today. I thought, if the Dolphins and Buccaneers got on the phone right now, and they said Tua for Tom Brady right now, I, I mean, it's not realistic, but who 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 would say no to that? Would anyone say no to that? Even I mean, I know there's been dirty pool with Brady trying to maybe make his way to Miami, but I even had that thought today. I was like, well, why don't we just do this now? <laughs> why don't we just make this trade happen right now? The odds of this happening, I think like hell would freeze over Joey. So it's like, I, I can't even answer that question. Cause like, we both know that'll never happen. It'll never years. happen. So like that, that's, that's where I'm at right now. And I, yeah, I, I'm just going to move on. Well, I, no, no, I'm give you a non-answer in all honesty. I just, I, I, I see what you're saying, but it, it won't, no, it won't happen. But I mean, it speaks to our, lo our larger issue too, as well. And I think it gives a lot of hope to some teams that are three and three, three and four right now, where the quarterback play across the NFL is not very good right now. I counted it today that the number is going to go down. There are 21 teams, Mark, that are either 500 or under 500 right now in the NFL. And then based on a couple of these outcomes here, that number is going to go down to 19. But it's a middle-of-the-pack world right now, and where can you make a difference? Can the Buccaneers rise above? What I will give credence to, what you said, Joey, is if I'm Tom Brady, I'm figuring out all of Odell Beckham Jr.'s favorites, whether it's his favorite food, his favorite kind of music, if there's certain things that he likes within a locker room, and I'm trying to recruit him onto my roster. Now the Buccaneers have somewhere between three and $4 million in salary cap space. So if Beckham wants to sign with the Buccaneers, it's probably going to have to be for less than what he's worth as a receiver. If I'm being Frank, but if I'm Tom Brady, it's like, I need any spark that I can get with an offense that has just been stagnant this season. Coming up towards the tail end of this pod, we are going to break down Steelers and Dolphins with Believe in Steelers, very own host we have here all the next hour. Mark Bergen, jump in the chat, drop a question if you want to. Uh, Mark, let's find out what Odell Beckham likes by bringing in our next guest here. Uh, this guy, he is a new member to the Believe roster. We're so happy to have him. I'm really glad we're connecting, and I'm glad that he's on. It's a Rams bye week, so it's a perfect time to bring him on. He is the host of Believe in Rams, Downtown Rams. You can find him all over YouTube right now. He found his way... Uh, Peter Schrager gave him an interesting shout out very recently in regards to Odell Beckham, his very self. Jake Ellen Bogan, man, thank you so much for coming on to Believe NFL Livestream. Um, how are you today? And what is Odell Beckham like? 
I'm doing well. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, you know, it's weird with Odell because there's so many different ways he's gone, uh, you know, just during this whole tour, I guess is what it's being called. I mean, you have on one hand, you know, Von Miller is saying, well, he's going to go to Buffalo. I'm telling you, he's going to go to Buffalo, all of that. Uh, but then on the other hand, you know, he's tweeting at Saquon Barkley a lot. You know, he's talking about the Giants. You know, he's tweeting that how much he wants to be back with the Rams, but they don't want him back or they haven't shown him the love. Um, you know, you've seen things where he's interacting with Mar uh, Marcus Spears of ESPN. Like, hey, these are the teams I want to go to. You know, Baltimore was listed in there. Um, I think Tampa is definitely, you know, in the mix, although if they continue to lose, probably not. I think it, it's something for Odell when it comes down to him. He's in a little bit of a weird predicament because what he did yesterday or, or, or last year is essentially when he went to the Rams, he reset his value. He put himself on notice like, hey, I still have this. And unfortunately, the injury sidelined him from getting some serious money in free agency. So he has to figure out a way that's conducive to building that value back up. And, you know, I do think obviously it's there, but he's not going to get paid what he wants to get paid. Ian Rappaport said, you know, he really wants Michael Gallup money. I mean, that's what he was trying to get from the Rams. And the Rams really could have done this, but they couldn't, you know, just I mean, they could have. It was possible to do it. But they were never just going to pay him $15 million, the, the money that they gave to Allen Robinson, when they knew he wasn't going to be ready to go until November or at the very least December. The timeline's always been there. So it's not anything new. Um, but it, it's really interesting because Odell wants to be in L.A. Everyone I've talked to, and I mean, it's just all over the place. He loves L.A. It was his first time where he truly feels like this is a home. He's not only been appreciated by his teammates, but by the fans, by the organization, up until, you know, this whole thing. However, Sean McVay did say they have not given their final offer on OBJ. And I, I've kind of thought about this for a little bit. And I don't think necessarily that this whole saga is over. I don't think it's a guarantee he goes back to the Rams. I do think they should be considered the favorite. Um, mm. But I think it's definitely possible, you know, we're not talking about the team he ultimately ends up with. And that's the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, they're a team that just continues to win. And, you know, no matter how good they make it look, he continues, they, they continue to win. And when you go to a team that has Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen, you have Kirk Cousins, you have Dalvin Cook, uh, the defense is there. You know, he's going to want to play for a Super Bowl. And, you know, I, I've already heard stuff like, you know, it's already been, you know, reported that this guy wants to continue playing or he wants to continue kind of holding out until he knows who's a contender. And so I think that does rule out some teams, but I think the Vikings here sitting at what five and one, I think are a team. I know Kansas city is also in the mix there, but everyone's talking about, you know, Buffalo and LA. I ultimately think it'll come down to Buffalo and LA, but keep your eye on the Minnesota Vikings. I think they're kind of the sleeper here. That's not being talked about. Uh, I agree with you. I've not, I've not heard that either. And that would be, that would be dynamite. That'd be quite a threat. Um, Jake, I want to, I want to throw this to you. And then Mark, I want you to weigh into as well. Um, you know, we're looking at it right now. The Chiefs just put another one on the 49ers right now. They're up 43-23. So let's start in your backyard, Jake, if that's right. Let's talk about the NFC West. Yeah. Cardinals pick up a big win on Thursday. Seattle, I mean, look, you know, Russell Wilson or no Russell Wilson, they're playing well again. And then, of course, the news of the week was Christian McCaffrey. You know, I've seen a little bit of your Twitter feed for, for those that are uh, tuning in right now. Just, you know, give me your thoughts on um, – Christian McCaffrey to the 49ers. Does it scare you? And are the Seahawks actually the biggest threat in the NFC North, uh, NFC West, excuse me, right now to the Rams moving forward over the next month? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, I think you go out, you get Christian McCaffrey giving up a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth next year. Um, people look at kind of picks like they're not a big Take deal for whatever <laughs> reason. And I think they are. Um, this is a guy that's missed 23 games. He's been on the injury report 29 times in his career. That's not good. Um, you know, when you're giving up picks like that, I mean, basically it was kind of explained, I think by Adam Schefter basically explained like the only reason they were able to do this is because of the minority coaching hires that they had, like those picks that they got, if they didn't get those picks, they wouldn't have been able to do this. They got two third rounders for Sala and McDaniel. Um, so that mm. was a huge thing for them and, and allowed them to make a trade like that. But I don't feel like he's the biggest issue. And as you know, 
My biggest issue with the 49ers is that I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo can win a Super Bowl. And if the name of the game isn't win- to win a Super Bowl, I don't know what it is then for the Niners to give up that many picks for Christian McCaffrey. Um, another thing, my issue with you know Christian McCaffrey is that you know you go out and you get a guy, you get like one of the best running backs in football, but for for why? I mean, like you're you're making Jeff Wilson look good. You're you're, you're having people when Christian McCaffrey got picked up. I literally saw my timeline. Like people are like, what am I going to do? Like you know, Elijah Mitchell, it, it, like what's going to happen to him? Who cares? Like you're talking about Christian McCaffrey. If he stays healthy, Elijah Mitchell does not matter. He is a jag compared to Christian McCaffrey. It, it goes back to the fact that Kyle Shanahan can make anybody look good in that offense. I think people forgot because he gave up on Trey Sermon so quickly. They haven't been great about drafting running backs. So that's probably another thing to this, but uh, you know, they use Trey Sermon and he ran for like 80 yards or something against Seattle. I mean, he ran well uh, when they used him, they didn't use him again. Um, but like anybody can have success out of that backfield. They turned a receiver into a running back in that backfield. And so it was kind of to give up that many, you know, picks. And then to also hear from that side, like this is the new F them picks. It's like, no, 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 no. When the Rams traded top dollar, they, tra- they traded those picks and all of that. They were trading for a franchise quarterback. They were trading for a cornerstone corner that could shut down, you know, the opposing number one receiver. They've traded for an explosive receiver in Brandon Cooks, who they ended up extending. Trading for a running back in the age of running backs don't matter. Not really. I I don't think that's the best usage of the draft picks. Um, so I do have a concern with that. But I, I also just feel like, you know, with the Niners, as great as their defense has been, the offense hasn't been great. And that does start with the quarterback. But also, I don't think the play calling has been all that great. So I think this does have a chance of opening that up a little bit. Um, but I, I'm not sold on them as like a Super Bowl contender. I think when you look at the Rams, they've started off slow, but they're three and three. And we saw today. I mean, the Packers didn't look good. Tampa didn't look good. The Ravens won. They don't look good. I mean, they really they look like the worst fourth quarter team in the league. So, you know, there are teams like that that are kind of along the same tier that don't look good either. And it's really, you know, intriguing with that. Now you look at Seattle and you mentioned them. They're hard because we don't know what they are. I don't really think the Chargers are all that great. So I'm not putting so much stock into this. Um, But the thing about Seattle is they have Shane Waldron who comes from the Rams system. So they're trying to run that Rams offense. And that does give them kind of the up there. And they have played the Rams tough even since you know, they've kind of fallen off a little bit. They had a tough game when they lost Russell Wilson. You know, they were still moving the ball uh, with Geno Smith. But this year, Geno Smith is leading the league in, you know, completion percentage. And, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with DK Metcalf. He left the game, but they still have plenty of weapons. You know, you look at Kenneth Walker, you know, how he's played since he's taken over. Seattle could be something. Arizona is not a team I'm at all worried about, though. They, they had a game against a team that, I don't think either of those teams are making the playoffs based like that Thursday night game was what we needed. Cause there was like a shootout. It was, you know, there were fireworks. It was exciting, but I don't think either of those teams are making the playoffs. So Seattle's a team. Like I don't, I'm not ready to say they're done, but I always kind of felt like before the season started, it was a two horse race in the FC West, the Rams and the Niners. My dog is a huge DK Metcalf fan and you just had to bring it up, didn't you? And he started barking. Uh, Mark, just, you know, weigh in real quick. Christian McCaffrey, you know, everyone's talking about it. Um, You know, does this move the needle for you in the NFC West? What does it do for the 49ers? And, uh, you know, how are you handicapping that moving forward? Obviously, they're losing today, but they're losing the Chiefs. So, I mean, what do we what do we make out of that? Yeah, I don't think any running back in the NFL in 2022 would make me really like be like, yep, this is going to help take the 49ers over the top. So I'm with Jake in that regard. Uh, I do want to push back. You mentioned the Vikings as a potential destination for OBJ. They would have to move some cap space around. They're dead last in the league right now in salary cap space. They have less than a million dollars to spend. So they would need to restructure someone's contract to be able to actually sign and acquire OBJ. I'll push back there too. And you mentioned that the Vikings is a potential contender. Like, I am not with you there at all. I know they've played very well this season, but I go based on what the last 30 years of my life has shown me paying attention to the NFC North. So I'm going to push back there respectfully. And I want to say one other thing as well, Joey. If I knew we were going on with the New Jersey Devils fan today, I would have painted my face (laughs) 
and painted my chest a la David Putty and Seinfeld. You got to support the team. Oh, man. <laughs> I was at the game yesterday, so I, it was good to see some good hockey since I'm also a Yankee fan and I didn't see any good baseball uh, throughout this whole ALCS. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think with the, the Vikings, what you just mentioned, I mean, there's definitely, you know, a lot of truth there. But I think when you when you look at, like, the connection, like, I mean, Kevin O'Connell comes from the Rams, so I do think. Hang on, hang on, hang on, Jake, 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 Jake. We're talking about Kirk Cousins, right? Yes, we are. <laughs> my, well, that's and, my and, point. That's, and, that's real quick, my, and real that's quick, and real quick, yeah. Let me let me frame it like this too, because this is one of the themes I wanted to get to today, and it kind of leads a little bit into a bit of a Joe Burrow conversation. Mm -hmm. But I kind of want to think after this week, you know, we've we're going to talk all we want about teams that are three and four, and again, I think we're going to reassess at Thanksgiving. So let's be very fair about that. But as it stands right now, I was looking at it, and I can only name five teams that I think are good and that are contenders right now. And you guys, I want I want to debate this a little bit and push back. If you want to add one, you want to take one off the list. But mm -hmm. here's what I have right now today that I think these teams are contenders right now. The Buffalo Bills, the Kansas City Chiefs, Cincinnati Bengals, the Dallas Cowboys, and I have to put the Giants in there because they're six and one. I know, but again, Mark, do the Vi are, are the Vikings in there? Can we honestly put? I mean, Jake, can we honestly put the Rams in there the way that they've played? I know they're the, the defending Super Bowl chance. Can we honestly put them in there right now? Can we put a Jets team that's probably going to go five and two? I mean, these are great records. They're pointing in the right direction. I'm just looking at where where are these teams with staying power right now? Bills and Chiefs are on an own tier, in my opinion, and then there's a second tier below that. And I was trying to, you know, do we give Hang the on, Giants Joey, respect? Can you repeat your five again, Joey? Bills, Chiefs, Bengals. I think the Bengals are back. I, I, I think they've righted the ship. I think we can count on them moving forward to be a good team. And then honestly, the other two I had were the Giants because they're six and one. Now it's a little bit of a Chicago Bears ish six and one, right? Where they get to the playoffs and no one gambles on them and they probably lose in the first round, but they have a great record and it's a great story. And in terms of staying power, I like that Dallas Cowboys defense. So hang on, you don't have Philly. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Philly's, Philly's the other one. I'm yeah, sorry. Philly's say. the other one. No, no, I no. I didn't. Say, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to do that. I definitely have Philly in there too as well. Uh, they're going to win some games. I think they're capable of winning a playoff game right now too as well. But is there any anyone else we can honestly put on that list right now? And who would you take off? I mean, I just don't know who's good. I think that's the issue. Like, aside from, like you said, like the Bills, they're five and one. The Eagles are six and oh. I mean, I'll say this, and this might be a little controversial, but like the Chiefs, I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing the Chiefs as a Super Bowl contender. Their defense is never it, right? And yeah. uh, Patrick Mahomes, they should have been in the Super Bowl last year. You know, I, I can't, I don't know if I can count on Patrick Mahomes because as great as he is, he gets cocky. And it, he he just does things that it, he didn't need to throw that pass to Tyree Kill down the left sideline against the Bengals. I mean, like that loss was on him. That loss was on Andy mm. Reid going for well, they went for two or no, they went for it on fourth down, say kicking the field goal at half. They they go for the the touchdown and they miss it. There are things like that where I feel like yes, Kansas City has the talent, but then when you you combine all of what I just said with the defense and how they've never kind of figured it out. They're not a dominant defense. I know what they're doing in the Niners today. I don't really think the Niners are that great. I mean, we'll see what happens. The Niners defense is really good. And, you know, Kansas City has exploited, you know, their biggest issue when you run to the outside. They, they struggle, so they've used a lot of end arounds today. Uh, but, I mean, I don't know. Like, the Bills, to me, have the best quarterback in the league in Josh Allen. Um, they have a running game that if they ever figure out how to balance it correctly, they're not going to be able to be beaten. They're really not. Cause when you have the pressure, they have up front Von Miller Russo. I, I mean, I think those two Russo's not getting anywhere near the credit he deserves. I mean, the guy's been an absolute stud and they're a draft like draft Twitter was trying to say he was a bust cause he had a fit 16 sack season at Miami and then sat out. Uh, he's been huge. You know, they've had some injuries, but I think Buffalo is legit. Um, Philly's legit. I don't think a lot of people like Jalen Hurts. I think that's what it comes down to. They don't trust Jalen Hurts. That that's okay. But I've also heard they don't trust Jalen Hurts. But then they want to tell me that, and not necessarily any of you guys, but like you know the Giants. Well, I don't trust Jalen Hurts, but the Giants could be. How could the Giants win the Super Bowl with Daniel Jones? I like explain that to me. I don't think 
Like anybody <laughs> can keep... obviously win the Super Bowl if they have like, you know, a Legion of Boom type of performance where all of a sudden you're up 43 to eight. Like, you know, just everything just kind of crumbles on the other team. Any quarterback can win a Super Bowl like that. But I mean, when we're talking about winning a Super Bowl, we're talking about playing in a close game, playing, you know, maybe a game down to the wire. Do you trust Josh Allen? I do. Do you trust Patrick Mahomes? I do. Although, like I said, he's had those moments, uh, but he's also won a Super Bowl. Do you trust Justin Herbert? I don't think the Chargers get that far, right? So that's kind of like my criteria there. Like Daniel Jones, I don't trust. Jalen Hurts, it's more of a wait and see approach. I don't think he's looked that bad. He has had postseason experience. And last year, I mean, it wasn't great, but I didn't hate the way he looked, despite the fact they were clearly outclassed by Tampa. Uh, then you look at Kirk Cousins. Do I trust him in the Super Bowl? Probably not, to be honest with you. But then but then um, Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow ends up in that list. Yeah, right? I, I trust Joe Burrow. I trust yeah, Joe yeah, Burrow. Yeah, yeah, So, Bowl. so we we got four. We got four there right now, Jake. So, what it sounds like is we're all in agreement, maybe on Bills, Chiefs, Eagles, Bengals. Yeah. So, Mark, if you Mark, if you had to round out the top five, and you had to put someone in a top five, who is it right now? I'm taking out the Giants from your list, Joey, just because Daniel Jones is your quarterback late in the postseason. Now, two potential, well, three potential divisions. You can laugh at this all you want to. Also a byproduct of a weak division in the AFC South. The Tennessee Titans are like consistently the worst best team, if that yeah, makes sense at all. That makes where... a lot of sense. It's, it's so <laughs> like, not, I'm not sexy. Even it's, it's so not... boring. It's so boring, but you're right. It's not. Yeah. But Mike Vrabel's team always plays tough. That's and I right, don't want to tackle King Henry, even if he's not quite, if he's, I don't know, 80 or 90% of what he was at his peak. Come late in the season. November, December, January, I don't want to tackle that guy. Even at three and four, the Bucks and the Packs, just given the pedigree of both of their quarterbacks too, because when push comes to shove and you need a play, even at their later in their career, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, I know Rodgers hasn't had the postseason success, but Tom Brady, this is what he thrives on. And it's like every single time we're ready to pour the dirt over the coffin, he finds a way to do it all over again. So I'd say the Titans, the Bucks, and the Packers are potentially – they'd have to do some things to get back into that mix. But from your five of Bills, Chiefs, Bengals, Giants, and Cowboys, obviously the Eagles too to make six, I'm taking out the Giants just because, yeah, I like Brian Dable, but like when push comes to shove, do you really trust Daniel Jones? And here's another way to look at it as well. If you ask a Giants fan say, hey, Daniel Jones is going to be your starting – quarterback come week one of the 2023 season what do you think their reaction is going to be yeah i mean he, I'll, he, I'll say he, this. Is, he had 100 rushing yards today and 200 passing and but I, I i hear you man they're doing it it's a smoke and mirrors type season we see a team do it every single year jake hop in yeah i i'm one of those people where like honestly i'd be looking at what bailey zappy's doing with new england and if i'm the giants I'd be like hey any chance Mac Jones is available. Like, I, I, I honestly, because I think Mac Jones <laughs> yeah. with that offense, with that defense, I think they can do something. Um, But I also have to say, I don't think I've given enough credit. I do think the Rams are still very much alive in this. I, I think they're absolutely one of the best teams in the NFC. Uh, they've had a lot go against them. They've had a lot of injuries. They're on their 10th guy on the offensive line. They're going to start their seventh different combination coming out of the bye. Uh, they've been without, you know, their 800 yard receiver last year in his second season, Van Jefferson. Um, you know, the Cam Akers thing, no one would have expected that. I mean, he's just completely imploded and doesn't look like he'll, ha he'll play another down for the Rams. And all the while, you know, having three out of the top four corners out, they're starting safety out. And yet, no big deal. Raheem Morris has him ninth in the league in defense. You know, here's here's my thing. OK, the Rams offense isn't playing well. The defense is playing enough, well enough where they should be five and one going into the bye. They should. I mean, the only game that they probably had no business winning was Buffalo, and they were only down by seven to start the fourth. But when you look at like the Niners game, everyone looks at, well, okay, it was 24 to nine. Yeah, because of the pick six at the end. But if you really think about it, that was a close game all throughout. And even still, despite the fact their center got hurt, the left guard got hurt, I mean, they had all sorts of injuries all over the line. They're starting a uh, third string center against the Niners that that pass rush and everything they're starting a third string center who was just trying to be in the police academy and you know now all of a sudden he's starting at center 
Um, and they were in that game. They were still moving the football. They made a couple, you know, poor decisions. Stafford did. And, you know, that's what ended up happening. But I've still, I've been impressed by the fight that this team has shown, despite the fact nothing seems to be going the way on the offense. And yet that defense keeps them in every game. They held, uh, you know, Cooper Rush looked unbelievable up until the Rams game. And they held him to what, 100 yards? You know, uh, PJ Walker, his longest pass in the air was one yard. I understand it's PJ Walker, but you saw what he did against Tampa's defense. And I was told before the season, Tampa's the no brainer NFC title winners. They're going to win it all. The Rams are not even close to them. And I'll say this right now I think the Rams are better than the Bucs. I think the Packers are better than the Bucs. Uh, I would probably take, I mean, there are some other teams in there. I mean, the, I think the Niners are. I mean, I'd probably say the Cowboys because that defense is ferocious. And uh, I think Jake, just to, Jake, just to interject, any team that's that's scoring touchdowns because the yeah. Buccaneers don't score touchdowns, man. Exactly. They kick field goals. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. And and yet I keep hearing how Brady doesn't have enough. No, no, no. no. Let, let, and that like that sentence needs to be gone. OK, he doesn't like if he doesn't have enough when you're talking about Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, Oh, he doesn't have Gronkowski. Okay. Bring Gronkowski back. It's not going to change this offense. It's not a good offense. And Brady honestly doesn't look that great this year. We need to like actually address the elephant in the room. Brady has not looked that great. He threw a touchdown to Mike Evans. Mike Evans dropped it. That happens all over the league, but we're going to hear it all, all week long about how Brady, well, he didn't play that bad. He almost hit the touchdown. He threw it right into Mike Evans. How many times do we see drops like that around the league? I mean, Lamar Jackson had about six touchdowns last year that were dropped by Marquise Brown. And people were trying <laughs> to tell me how great Marquise Brown was of a pickup for the Cardinals. So I, I don't know. I, I look at it like right now things can change. And, you know, you definitely mentioned it. I mean, Brady at some point, you know, we've kind of ruled him out before and things could change. But I don't know. I, I don't think Tampa, like it, it's not just their offense. Their, their defense still lost to Mitch Trubisky. I mean, they concussed. Pick it and Trubisky came into the game and they still, you know, they they still won. Um, like a white knight on a steed. Yeah. I mean, you rushing know, in a hero, some would say. Favorite punching bag, right? Like everybody's favorite punching bag. He comes in. <laughs> he's and he my, he's my punching bag. He's my punching bag, That's Jake. Fair. That's yeah, fair. <laughs> like we have the we have the host of uh, believe in Steelers and believe in Bears, so you know that make that makes sense. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know. I don't I don't have any issue with Trubisky. I will say by the way for the Steelers, okay, uh, don't rule out the Steelers to do something this year. Don't don't rule it out. What they what they have got out of Alex Highsmith, I'm just gonna say that right now. He's stretching. The kid he's is special, up. and what he's doing now because he was doing it before. And no one was talking about it. And the people that were talking about it is, oh, he's on the same defense as Minka and TJ. Well, what's the deal now? With, with TJ out, he has to take on the double teams at times. I mean, he is the guy. And Alex Highsmith is, well, coming in this league, uh, this week was leading the league in sacks with six and a half. That's legit. Okay, like this Steelers defense is good enough when if they stay in contention, TJ comes back. I'm just saying, like we've seen teams – Win Every, Super Bowls because yeah. of their defense. I'm not saying they're going to win a Super Bowl, but Pickett has shown me some things where he's not just a rookie. He can contribute, and they have one of the better backups in the league in Trubisky. Uh, you can say what you will about you not liking him as a starter, but he's one of the best backups in football. And so I think when you have Najee Harris, you have the receiving room that they have. I mean, we still haven't really seen Calvin Austin. I'd like to see him get going. Um, but I don't, I don't know, like Friar I mean, you got Deontay Johnson, you know, they'll probably, maybe they'll trade Claypool. I don't know how much I buy that news, but you know, I just think they have a lot of talent and, you know, we pretty much mentioned the entire league. So I got to mention the Steelers. They're sitting here at two and four. I think they went tonight against Miami and, uh, you know, I think they're a team to look out for moving forward. I mean, I, in, in a league where no one is separating except for a few, the Steelers are not done. I feel like everyone ruled them out and forgot, you know, they did beat the Bengals. I know it was a crazy game, but that tiebreaker is going to matter. If they can beat the Bengals again, they have the tiebreaker over the Bengals. That's going to matter down the stretch. Yeah. Jake, Mark, hop, if I could interject in. really quickly, I, I think it's really not so much about the Steelers, but about the rest of the AFC North division, which mm. is again, not particularly yes. strong this season. No, so, they don't finish games. Yeah. So, yeah. So what, what you're saying, I mean, I'm like, Pass me whatever Kool-Aid you're drinking, pass me some, because I love to hear it. But again, for me, with the Steelers' problems are 
then you look across the division and it's just like, well, it's still attainable to where a nine and eight record might win the AFC North this season. For me, it's really the offensive line because they haven't gotten any push up front. Absolutely. And you don't want to get Pickett killed back there coming off a concussion, going against Tua tonight, who missed the last two games with a concussion. So that's like your worst, your worst fear because going into the year, Najee was a little bit banged up. Minka Fitzpatrick's had injuries. The Steelers have been ravaged with injuries. So this is a big game tonight uh, in Miami. Brian Flores, former head coach, going against Miami for the very first time since he coached there three years ago. Had the lawsuit against the NFL with his time there. Minka Fitzpatrick's first game back in Miami playing the Dolphins for the first time since he got traded to the Steelers. And he's been not just a Pro Bowl, but an all-pro safety. And he was the league's highest paid safety before Derwin James won up them this offseason. But he's played really well this season, too, when he's been healthy. But he missed the Bucs game with the knee injury. So we'll see if he goes tonight. But, like, for me, the Steelers, it's like if they can get to three and five or four and four by the bye week, I'm with you. Tonight's game's absolutely huge against Miami. It's almost a must win to make sure that you can stay in a division in the AFC North that has just been very, very middle of the road, very, very average. I think the AFC North is going to have a nine and eight winner, maybe 10 and seven, nine and eight, eight and nine, maybe even eight, and nine, maybe even a sub 500 record wins that division this season. It's just been, it's, the parody is there, Joey, and that was really kind of the theme off the top of today's show tonight. You have a lot of teams at, at or below 500 right now, and there's a lot of parody in the league. Yeah, especially in the NFC. I mean, it is realistic. At this time, we will see what it's like in a month again, but a 7-10 and 10 team could definitely make the playoffs this year. That is a very realistic possibility. I'm not so sure about the AFC, but in the NFC, it's kind of sort of trending in that direction. Now, we'll see. I do want to get to, uh, Mark, you brought up a great topic, and I have a I have a bullet uh, this guy has got a bullet right next to his name uh, of who's the next coach that's going to be fired. But Mark, I want to follow up with you really quick. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jake, I'd love to have you weigh in too as well. Um, you know, I'm believing Steelers this past week, you, you and Ike had a fantastic conversation and it relates to something that you just mentioned about the two quarterbacks that are playing tonight. So I want to open up the floor to you in two ways. Um, one, I understand that everyone passes concussion protocol. I understand that we've done everything that we can to create a baseline to provide ourselves an idea whether a player can return to the field or not. In my opinion, I think we're heading towards a little bit of a gray area or a little bit of a tipping point where if you get a concussion in a game and you leave the game, you should be ineligible to play the very next week. So, Mark, I'll open it like this. Are you on board with Kenny Pickett playing tonight? Do you think Tua coming back is a little bit too early? I know we're not doctors, but my God, we have to start erring on the side of caution. And I think you guys had a really great conversation on your show this week. Thank you for that. I... um. Sometimes you got to go with what your eyes are telling you. Now, if he's passed protocols this week and he also practiced this week, so it's not like, mm-hmm. you, and I know the quarterbacks aren't getting hit in practice. It's not nearly the same thing as a game, but especially considering the league updated its protocols mid season after what happened with Tua, if, if they're saying Pickett's good to go and he's cleared, you have to try to take the league at their word at that point, given the adjustments that they've made. With Tua, it's just like, you know, they were calling it a back injury where everyone knew when, and I'm talking about the concussion before, you know, he was out on the field and his fingers were, he he was holding up his fingers because he got absolutely rocked. But when he trips and falls and it's just like, uh, this ain't a back injury. And the league even fired the doctor who was supposed to be the independent doctor to evaluate him. You know, I, I talked to Ike about it and he's seen it all in his 12 years and he, and I'm going to, you know, summarize what he told me, but when he's like, you know, he's willing to sacrifice pretty much any limb of his body his ACL, you know, a leg, a knee, an ankle, a hand, a finger, what have you. But when someone doesn't know where they are and they get put to sleep, it's a scary, scary thing. And the league needs to do everything that it can in its ability to protect its players At the same time, too, like Joey, I liken this conversation to the last few weeks. Some of the roughing the passer penalties have been absolutely ridiculous. So it's like, to me, it's just as simple as what are your own two eyes telling you on one any individual play? I don't want to give some broad overgeneralization that paints a brush over everything. But it's like, what are your two eyes telling you? And I hope that the league, with the adjustments that they've made, again, mid-season because of what happened to Tua, are pointing in the right direction. I know one of the things they're doing, Joey, is at least in practices and training camp, they wear those 
goofy helmets with the bubbles. And I guess that's supposed to reduce the impact. But um, I do think the league has made a lot of strides in this regards. Cause like 20 years ago, Joey, you know, you'd be waking up seeing stars and, Oh, he's woozy, shake it off. And you're out there on the next play. So I get it at the same time. It's really hard for defense. Cause it's like, okay, you can't hit above the head, but you can't hit below the knees, at least at the quarterback position. So what the heck do you tackle? You know, I don't think there's one silver bullet solution to all of this too. So you yeah. want to keep the player safe. And like, I even told Ike this too, if the Steelers win tonight, yeah, I want to see them get after Tua, but I want to see them beat the Dolphins straight up with Tua at his full capability tonight versus, you know, whether it's Teddy Bridgewater or another backup for the Dolphins. But I want to hear what Jake has to say. I'll, I'll hop off here. No, I, I agree with you. I think it's been kind of concerning uh, how we don't know what roughing the passer is in 2022. We also, I mean, it took them, you know, this whole kind of revamping of the whole concussion protocol mid season. Um, a little concerning. And I think, you know, anytime we talk about anything like, you know, head injuries, I just think back to, I, I forget what game it was, but Austin Colley on the, the Colts when, you oh know, his, his hands just like, you know, he just looked like completely like his soul left his body type deal. And it's like a really scary event. Um, I forget what it's called, like the fencing, right? Like when your your hands kind of they, they kind of curl up. Um, it's called like the, the fencing thing. I forget what it is, but it, it's, oh, you're you're on to see. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's like a primitive uh, like. It's like a body reaction to, to mm-hmm. yeah, like when you get like a, a serious impact to like the skull or like the brain. Um, just yeah, I mean, I think they just they got to do a better job of that. I mean, there are guys. I, I remember Case Keenum on the Rams when they played against the the Ravens, and the guy is crawling on the field, and he starts walking over, like stumbling over to the Ravens sideline, and he stayed in the game. And at that point, I was like, man, I hope the Rams lose because it's like, you know, you got to take the guy out and you deserve to lose if, if you're going to do something like that. I mean, I understand. Obviously, it's a competitive league. There's so much money riding on like everything. But, you know, it, it's like if the Colts didn't take out Naeem Hines. Can you imagine that? I mean, he was like he couldn't stand. I mean, you can't let get to the point where, you know, these guys, obviously, we know the effects after football we know that ct is real but when these guys start having those effects like early on in their career because they're not doing a good job of preventing that it's a dangerous sport there's going to be concussions i'm not saying there's not but you can do a better job of making sure a guy doesn't go in right after he just got a concussion and do further damage yeah jake that's kind of a little bit of what i'm getting at and clearly it looks like we don't have the science just to test gradient level of concussion Right. There's there's a version yeah. that you go into the tent, you pass a baseline test, you can go back into the game. And then there's other versions that we've seen that are downright scary to watch and they happen real time. And and Jake, you've done a great job of illustrating different precedented uh, you know, examples of that in the past. You know, the thing is the one thing that I do think that we're learning a little bit is that the one when you get the concussion and you get it the very next week, you get it within that small span of time. I think that's when we really need to start digging in and do all that we can to figure out a way to, you know, not only prevent that. And if there is a gradient level version of concussion that would take a person to make him ineligible the very next week, I want to see that happen. Um, I don't think we want, we don't want to see either quarterback, any quarterback ever get a concussion, but the Kenny Pickett thing, just really quick, you know, after he got that concussion, just based on what we know with Tua. And if you want this guy to be your future, I just don't understand why he's starting tonight. I mean, I get it. He's cleared. He's practiced in full. I totally understand. And I'm not in the locker room. And I'm definitely not Mike Tomlin. Okay? So um, this is not a criticism. But in my opinion, it just seems like, you know, if your guy gets a concussion that first week, and what we're learning is if you get one in the second week, not only can, you know, it can mess with the here and now, but it can mess with the rest of his life, um, I probably would have sat him down. Um, we we're here on Believe NFL live stream week seven. Um, I, I appreciate you guys weighing in on that. Um, I am going to move on to a different topic because uh, we just got a little bit of time left. I do want to preview Steelers and Dolphins. I want to hit Mark's topic uh, here right now. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mark, I want you to go first on who, who do you think the next coach is to be fired? Cause I got one. It is so easy. It is so simple. And damn it. I find the guy to be completely entertaining, but the guy can't 
coach. I um, think, and I think you're in. I think you're in my brain, Joey. I don't know why Dan Campbell's not in the conversation for this. <laughs> Thank you. What like, is the? What is that? What is that? What is their season? Okay, Lions fans got so got so chesty coming into this year that Jared Goff is someone that he isn't, and then all their draft capital and Dan Campbell's, you know, his grit and his fire was going to make them competitive. And sure, they scored some points early on in the season, but they gave up just as many. And now they come out in a bye week. And Jared Goff looks like Jared Goff still, Jake. You're going to weigh in on a little bit of some Jared Goff in a second here. But, I mean, dude, it's not working. They're one in five. Adam Gase man. (laughs) They're they're one in five, Mark. They're one in five. Time to move on. Get that number one pick. Get yourself a Bryce Love, a CJ Stroud, and it's time to move on, right? I, I think that's an easy call. It's Dan Campbell, right? He makes for a great hard knocks character. I I love his passion. I love his fire. I love his desire. The best NFL coaches are even keel head coaches. I'm talking. Yeah. Like I I don't see like, I'm not saying you can't ever show emotion or passion or fire, but like just wait, like it just hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked. And like, it's entertaining as hell on NFL hard knocks and behind the scenes. And like, Look, man, I I watch some of his pump up clips when I want to go to the gym. I I won't lie to either of you. Mark, real quick, could you imagine like dating Dan Campbell where he's just like, I'm going to take you to dinner. And if you trust me and if you just give it your all, this relationship will work and we will get dessert and it will work out. Please just I promise you, please just trust me. Uh, It's just unbelievable. Uh, Jake, uh, is is it? I have I have a good runner up, too. I want to hear who do you think the next coach fired is? Uh, give us a little bit of some Jared Goff, and please tell the Lions fans that, like, look, look, he he just isn't he just isn't it. He's not it. Yeah, I. Can we stop the whole? Oh, we'll see. Jared Goff has a higher completion percentage or touch date. First off, he didn't. But second, like, it was. I had to hear it at the beginning of the year. Like, it was. It was weird because there are a lot of Lions fans. And this is why I'll go easy on them because. There are a lot of Lions fans that, you know, basically follow my content because they follow Stafford. Um, this is not directed at them. But the Lions fans that are constantly trying to compare Goff and Stafford like there's even a comparison to be made. Uh, I mean, what are you doing? Like, really? What, what are you doing? Um, Jared Goff, a, a, like, you can say what you will about Stafford's interceptions, I'll tell you right now, the interceptions don't bother me because I used to watch Jared Goff fumble the ball like four times a game. And he's doing it. He did it twice, back-to-back drives. He killed my parlay. We won't get into that. But uh, back-to-back drives against Dallas, at the end of the game, he fumbles the ball. And you could say, oh, the pass pass protection's been great in Detroit. Okay? Uh, He holds on the ball too long. And, yeah, the hand size is an issue. It's always been an issue. Why do you think you breathe on him and he drops the ball? I mean, I, I really like, I like golf as a, like, I think he's a good dude and I think he's been through some things and, you know, I was really inspired by his performance, you know, looking at California, you know, when they go one in 11 and he just took ownership, right. He's just broken, beaten, scarred in that first year in Cal. Uh, He took ownership and eventually the offense got better and then he became the number one overall pick. Um, And he did the same thing. 2016, 0-7 0-7 with the Rams. You know, we're going to get this fixed. Then the next year, they get Sean McVay, and they go to the playoffs. But I think a problem is there's a disconnect where there's still people that feel like he is the reason that Sean McVay went to the playoffs and not Sean McVay was the reason Jared Goff went to the playoffs. If this Super Bowl didn't tell you anything, I mean, <laughs> like, do you really think in that Bengals game, I mean, I had people telling me in the Niners game, uh, uh, I think it was a, a couple weeks ago, the Niners Rams game that Jared Goff would have won that game. Jared Goff would have turned that into a 40 to nine game. Like, cause he fumbles the ball like crazy. He would not have won that game, but the Super Bowl, he would not have won it with the lions. It's like, it's, it's weird because Dan Campbell, there are some situational things I really don't like that he does at the same time. It's like, man, what would Dan Campbell be like if he had a Bryce Young or a CJ Stroud? You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. Like, there are times where they're in a game, they're they're doing well, and then I, I watch Jared Goff fumble the ball away. And it's like, I'm not saying that Campbell's going to win you a Super Bowl. That's not what I'm saying. 
but I don't think he's been as bad as the record would indicate, which I hate saying because the record is what you are. But I'm just like, can you imagine if he even had like what Cooper Rush was doing in Dallas? It was amazing. But if he had a Cooper Rush who was taking care of the ball, not putting the ball on the ground like crazy, he'd probably win a couple of those games, right? I mean, everyone talks about, well, Jared Goff, you know, he had to lead them back. He had 11 touchdowns in the first whatever weeks. They had more points scored than anybody, more touchdowns. Yeah, but it's it's kind of like the effect, like when you throw two at the beginning of the game, two interceptions, you put yourself in that hole, right? I mean, yeah, well, yeah, and to Jake, be and to be very fair, like to be very fair, Jamal Williams fumbled for the first time on the one yard line. I just Jamal think they're Williams poor, fumbled. They're, they're they're poorly coached, and 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 it's just not working out there. And they're one and five. Mark, go ahead. I'm with Jake in this regard. Not all turnovers are created equal. Not all interceptions are created equal. So I'm with him there. And you mentioned Jared Goff and some of your listeners, Jake. I'm going to instill some knowledge. I'm going to drop a nugget on you <laughs> that I would like to share with your followers. There have been two people in the history of man that have moved from Los Angeles to Detroit. Jared Goff is one of them. Blake Griffin is the second. You mean the reverse Axel Foley? (laughs) Oppo Oppo, Oppo Axel Foley? (laughs) One of the greatest characters in fictional history. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're not, you're not wrong there. Um, (laughs) Blake Griffin. <laughs> I'll say this. A, a no, coach, not willing. He didn't do it willingly. A coach I, I want to actually I, I want to actually see be put on the hot seat. He's not going to get put on the hot seat after today because they won a game and they, that's just not going to happen. But Ron Rivera, I, I what he's had three winning seasons. He went to a Super Bowl. How different is he than Jeff Fisher? Let, let's be real here. How different is he than Jeff Fisher? Because he's not. They both lost in the Super Bowl. I mean, I've never seen a guy get so much protection from criticism than Ron Rivera. You know, he can he can throw Jack Del Rio under the bus. He can throw Carson Wentz on the bus. This guy literally can say whatever he wants because he's a nice guy. The industry likes him. The the peers like him. Uh, the players I hear really like him, but that doesn't result in winning. Do you know who else the players love? Jeff Fisher. It didn't result in winning. So I I just feel like, you know, obviously we're talking about Dan Campbell and I'm not saying to deflect Dan Campbell. Like, yes, if this continues, he'll be fired. Um, But I like, I've heard Dennis Allen. I disagree with that. You got to let him, you know, run the course there with the saints. I don't think they're done. I don't think they'll necessarily make the playoffs, but I don't think it's like a one year and you're out deal. Um, But yeah, I just Ron Rivera to me, I don't know why he's there. I mean, I just feel like with Washington, and I understand, you know, Washington fans aren't going to like this, but you guys had Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, uh, Matt LaFleur, <clears throat> Zach, Zach, uh, what's his name? Zach, I totally forget his name. The, Zach uh, Taylor. Zach Taylor, thank you. Mm-hmm. Aubrey Pleasant, okay? You had Ajiro Evero, who just is an absolute dominant defensive coordinator for the Broncos. You know, all those coaches, I probably mentioned, I probably missed a bunch of them. Uh, Raheem Morris as well. You had all those coaches and you're with Ron Rivera and you let all those coaches leave because you had Jay Gruden like Washington at some point. Like, I think they're overdue. I I think honestly, if they don't make the playoffs this year, like Ron Rivera has to be out the door. They need to go after new blood. They need to get back to, you know, okay. the (laughs) Well, (laughs) you get my point. I mean, it really, what it has to come down to is this. Okay. You just lost what McVay and all those guys. You got to find the next guy like that. And I mean, you're probably not going to because McVay's don't grow on trees. But I mean, you're, you're look at like Dable. Dable should have been the head coach for the Redskins or uh, the Commanders. I, it, no doubt. Because if Dable was in Washington right now, whether it was Wentz or, or Heineke or whoever, Dable's winning games with lesser talent than Washington has. They are literally six and one because Dable knows how to coach. And he also brought. <clears throat> Uh, what's his face over Wink Martindale from the Ravens, who was one of the best, uh, you know, coaching hires, I think of, of the off season. J- well, Jake, Jake, does, yeah. Jake, does Joe Gibbs have any eligibility left? <laughs> but Joey, let me tee you up here. You mentioned you had another candidate, someone else who should be on the hot seat. Who is that other yeah. coach that you wanted to mention? 
So I don't think he gets fired midseason, but it looks like Frank Reich is uh, slowly moving his way out of Indianapolis. I just see the, a scenario of if they muddle around 500, even if they get to the playoffs, I don't see them winning a playoff game. I don't think Matt Ryan's long for the organization. They've had a lot of swings at that, a lot of bites at the apple with the quarterbacks there. It isn't really working. And it, for an organization that probably wants to do a quick reset with a really strong running back still on a rookie clock, um, it just doesn't look like it's working out for Frank Reich. I'm not seeing the results. And to your point, Jake, just real quick, you know, the thing with Ron Rivera, in my opinion right now, and you you mentioned it, the, why did Jeff Fisher stay the, the coach of the Rams for so long? Because of organizational things that went above him, distress and distraction. So they were obviously moving out to L.A. We're not going to upset the apple cart on the field. We're just going to keep this guy here. And, and try and get things done organizationally up top. Ron Rivera is still probably the coach of the commanders because every other NFL team right now is trying to get Dan Snyder out of that seat in Washington. And that enough is itself to probably not, not add on another distraction. So let's just keep trotting Ron Rivera out there. Cause you know what? He's a classy guy and he represents the organization yep. really well. And, you know, and just go out and we'll do that. Um, Jake, we got to let you go here, man. Uh, we're coming up uh, towards the very tail end of our show. Uh, Jake Allen Bogan, man. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Great to meet you, dude. Great, Great to, to connect. Uh, we're, we're here every single week, man. I hope to have you back either as a co-host or, or a guest. Uh, but just do me a favor. If you can just plug, uh, plug your show, plug your Twitter, all that good stuff, man. Thanks for coming on. And, uh, and hopefully the Rams will turn it around as you, as you, uh, believe that they will. Well, I appreciate you having me. It's been fun getting to know you guys for the last, you know, 50 something minutes. So I uh, appreciate you having me and yeah, you can, uh, go follow me over on Twitter at JK Bogan. Everything's there. Um, and, uh, Jake Allen Bogan's my name. You can find me on YouTube as well. I cover the Rams and jets, uh, believe in Rams podcast. Check it out. I'm, uh, I'm out of here. Thanks guys. Jake, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Believe NFL live, man. Be well. And I uh, hope to have you back. Thanks. You too. Take care guys. Thanks. We've got just a couple of minutes here. We're going to do a quick little wrap up here with Mark Bergen here and believe NFL live. This was week seven, Mark. Um, I'm going to throw a couple things at you. Uh, you can react however you want give you a couple of options here. So a weird trend that's been happening in the NFL, in my opinion, I highlighted it last week and I'm seeing a lot of fumbles on the field, Mark, and I'm starting to count them. Okay. Now these are just fumbles that are being lost. These aren't even fumbles that happen. And then they're recovered by the same team last week, Mark in the day games, not counting Thursday or Monday. So who knows what happened in that 14 fumbles happen in the games this week, 15 fumbles lost throughout today's slate of games. Um, we can say, I don't know. I just feel like that there's some sort of weird 538 article that's coming out about that very soon. Um, I find it to be very strange, especially in a year when the quarterbacks aren't very good. The running game is more prioritized and all of a sudden we're seeing a ton of fumbles. We're seeing them on special teams, but 15 fumbles lost today. Um, that's about like 1.3 per game. Uh, I just wanted to throw that out there, but before we go, I'm going to give you your, uh, dealer's choice here. Um, Steelers dolphins or Taylor Swift's new album, whatever you want, buddy. <laughs> we can go track by track or we can go quarter by quarter for the oh, game tonight man. no i do i, I do expecting I, that one I was no i i do you give me I a want to make, my own medicine joey i want to make some room i want to make some room for you to talk a little bit more about steelers dolphins that's yeah. coming up in about 15 minutes um this is your account you know what i mean this is this is your this is your corner here and i just want to open it up for you about what you're looking at what what are the some of the keys to the steelers tonight and do you think they win well a week ago when the Steelers beat the Buccaneers, remember Brian Flores was on the Patriots staff for 11 seasons. And okay, they're playing the Buccaneers. Why does that matter? He's going to know Tom Brady's tendencies, what he likes to do, what he doesn't like to do, what he does well, what he doesn't do well. He is going to have that same insider information going up against a Dolphins team that he's coached for the past three seasons. It is a tremendous advantage. And it's an advantage that, you can't get from another GM, another coach, another player, because he was the head coach for the Dolphins for the last three seasons. And there is, you know, publicly, both Flores and Minka Fitzpatrick are going to say all the right things publicly. But inside the locker room, whole <laughs> other conversation. And so there's a reason why there are times storylines get drawn up. This is one of them. And considering that, again, with the lawsuit against the league, Mike Tomlin provided Brian Flores a lifeline. And I credit Flores for humbling himself too, to take a much lesser salary than he was making as a head coach in this league. Because 
Whether you think Flores was the answer or not with the Dolphins, and I am a fan of Mike McDaniel. I am a fan of what Tua's done this season when he's been healthy. He's played at a very high level, a level that I don't know if he'd have achieved with Brian Flores. Having said all of that, there's no debate that Brian Flores should be a head coach in the NFL right now. When you see some of these other teams in the league and you see some of the questionable decisions that they make, Brian Flores should be, he's good enough to be a head coach in this league among the 32 teams right now. And he's on the Steelers staff. So to me, there's that personal factor tonight down in Miami to where it's just like, if you want to win one all season, this has got to be like the Super Bowl for him. This date, October the 23rd, had to be circled on the calendar in prime time, mind you, as well. I'm curious to see how much this is brought up in the broadcast tonight because it doesn't nearly necessarily depict the league in the best depiction for what happened with him in Miami as well. So that's what I am looking at. And on the field, I expect the Steelers to come out hot, playing for their coach, playing for Minka Fitzpatrick, who has been an all-pro safety. And for whatever reason, when he was down in Miami, they had him playing in the box when it's just like, let him roam like Ed Reed, like the center fielder, like the free safety. So that's what I'm looking at. Pickett coming back from the concussion, Tua coming back from the concussion too. Those are really the big storylines going into this game. And the Steelers found a way to snap a four-game losing streak last week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers team that might not be that good. But how do the Dolphins look with Tua coming back where he was rolling and the Dolphins have now lost two straight in Tua's absence? So the storylines write themselves. I am very, very excited to see how this one unfolds because if the Steelers want to salvage their season, they have to win tonight. Yeah, I wasn't really too affected whether, you know, Tua was going to play in this game or not to think that the Steelers had a chance to win. And, uh, you know, just to bring up your point really quickly, I mean, it is interesting that, look, you know, when you make head coaching hires, especially when, let's just say, in a particular situation like the Chicago Bears, when they have a new general manager, you got to get the thing right and you have to have philosophy and principle and attitude. It all has to be aligned so that you can work together on the same page. But don't tell me for one second. Matt Eberflus has a better resume than Brian Flores. If we want to just talk strictly mm-hmm. defensive coaches, right? So, I mean, that in itself right there kind of made me just made me scratch my head just in general. I kind of wanted Brian Flores to be the next coach of the Chicago Bears. It didn't happen. Um, yeah, you know, I'm looking at this matchup tonight, and, man, you know, Minka versus Tua. I like that matchup, right? I mean, Tua is a guy who I don't think has the best arm in the NFL. I'd probably put it at average at best. And they have the type of offense where if you look at it, Tyreek Hill right now has 700 yards. He's on pace for over 2,000 receiving. And I think that they are going to try and take their shots. And if they do that, is there an opportunity for Minka to make a play? And it's just going to really come down for me to... You know, what do they pick their poison with it with Waddle and Hill, right? I don't think you're gonna be able to stop them both at the same time, but can you limit them? So let's just be generous. Let's be generous here. 30 yard pops, right? You can't if we're gonna play, if the Steelers are gonna play a game tonight where they're giving up 50, 60 yards on a play to Tyreek Hill, I, I just don't think there's any possible way that they win this game. They have to figure out a way to at least kind of minimize those explosive plays. And then on the offensive side of ball, man, man can I keep beating the same drum of like can we get Najee Harris going? I mean, is there any sort of is there any sort of way that they can help out their rookie quarterback and even a Mitch Trubisky type with a guy who Najee Harris, who I like a whole lot. I mean, granted, I don't think he has top end speed, but I think between the tackles, he's good enough. I think around the edge, I think he's good enough. He can break tackles. But man, can you get this guy going? Because if there is something that they can just resemble an average to above average running game, the Steelers will have a chance. All this stuff that we're talking about projecting, not just tonight, but moving forward uh, in the weeks ahead. The song hasn't equaled its parts for the Steelers offense this season. And that's been the most frustrating part. That's why you make the change from Mitch Trubisky to Kenny Pickett. With the running game though, Joey, I'm with you and I'll lay this on you. The Steelers going into the last week, and I don't know how many other teams are still this way, they don't have a single rush of 20 yards or more this season. 18-yard rush is their longest run this season. Jesus, It's a problem. It's a problem. So it's like, take the top off a of defense. You talk about that from passing, passing. Can you stretch the field? Can you throw the ball down the field? All that's great. They can't do that with the running game. 
And Najee was a pro bowler last year, remember now too. But this is a Steelers offensive line where, okay, let's, you know, you lose Marquise Pounce, you lose David, DeCa- lose David DeCastro in recent seasons, both all pro players. David DeCastro in the 2012 season, the 2012 draft was the last time that the Steelers drafted an offensive lineman or the, in the first or the second round of the draft. Wow. 2012. So Man, that's you know that's surprising. That's surprising, and maybe that has a factor, a little Big Ben factor in there, right? But I feel yeah. like they had always had a good run at that. But I guess I never really realized that they stopped doing that. The cupboard is bare, Joey, and so the offense will continue to be hamstrung because I don't think Najee's a hundred percent. By the way, either he went in with a foot the injury foot, this right? year, yeah. but at the same time, it's just like man, anyone I think would struggle with the lack of push up front. And then there have been individual clips where you get, you get the keyboard warriors that'll show, well, there was a hole on this play and Najee didn't hit the hole. Right. And, you know, I can find one clip to paint whatever narrative I want to about any team or player in the league. But Um, I see that on Twitter sometimes too, but it's just like point blank period. The Steelers run offense. Like they're not going to finish last. They made that clear in drafting Najee with the first round pick a few years back out of Alabama, but when the Steelers have struggled to run the football, it's just kind of an oxymoron for traditionally when you think Pittsburgh Steelers football. Well, and then, and and I'm going to throw out a little bit of a cliche here, but it's a part of it's, I think it's important when you talk about it with a rookie quarterback and it's a little thing that you have to have just general confidence. And what do I mean when I say confidence is that what is the first thing that we say when we talk about rookie quarterbacks? You got to keep them out of third and long situations, right? So what is the point if you are in third and short and you don't have confidence to run your stuff in those moments and instead you're kind of like doing this thing of like, maybe let's try and push this button here and maybe we'll try and we'll try and switch it up here and maybe like catch them a little bit off guard instead of saying it's third and three and we're just going to go and get three yards and we're going to move the chains and and, and keep it rolling. I mean, this is extends back to Mitch Trubisky to start the season. Now, Mitch did not play very well. Check down Charlie. Right. But still, if you're telling me in third and three and third and four, you know that you can run these four or five same plays and get what you want on the regular it kind of changes the complexion of how you run your offense. And for a guy like Kenny Pickett on third and two and third and three, if they're sitting there and Matt Canada saying, well, maybe, maybe we should do a rollout or a quick little, quick little something to a tight end. Instead of saying, let's just give the ball to our best offensive player, Najee Harris and make something happen. If you don't have that confidence, it really kind of screws a little bit with how you go about your business offensively. Or to get him in space. I'm not necessarily saying you need to line up under center with a fullback and hand on the ball, but he's demonstrated the ability to catch the ball to the backfield, create one-on-ones for him and put him in the slot. He can, the the reason why he was a first round pick is yeah. I mean, he can hurdle over guys and he's, I love when he just uses a stiff arm to shove a guy to the ground. All that's great, but he's good in pass protection. He's good at catching the ball to the backfield too. So maybe use him a little bit more creatively than just to say, Hey, shotgun going to hand the ball off to where it's just such an inefficient play. And it's just like, Let's beat our head into the wall time and time and time again. Try something different to get him the ball in a one-on-one matchup where he can take advantage of to where if it's a linebacker, he can outrun him. And if it's a DB, he's going to run over a DB or or win the strength battle with the DB every single time. You're going to need multiple defenders to bring him to the ground. So that's where if you're not getting the push up front, are there creative ways you can use him out of the backfield and use your short passing game as an extension of your running game? Yeah, it's a great point. And just off the top of my head, you know, uh, put Claypool or Deontay Johnson on one side of the field and just have Najee run a wheel route against a linebacker trailing whatever route that they're running and clear out that one side of the field for them. And Pickett can make that throw and, uh, you know, just see what you can and try and get the ball in his hands as best you can. Uh, we got to roll. National Anthem's a couple minutes away. Do Steelers win tonight? Give us a final score prediction or just tell us whether they win or lose. 27 24. I've got the Steelers winning down Ooh. in Miami. Ooh. Brian Flores, Minka Fitzpatrick revenge game. Let's go, baby. So you're saying you're saying um either a defensive score or you're saying defensive uh turnover that leads to a short field, right? Or are you I mean, are you saying Pickett gets you to 27? <laughs> oh no, no, they're gonna need some help. Steven Sims, return man for the Steelers, who made two key returns in the week six win over the Bucks, is out tonight. Gunnar Oshesky will be back as a return man. 
He's had some problems hanging on to the football. They're going to need some help, either a big defensive player or special teams play, Joey, just given the struggles of this offense. But I'm with you there. To, to expect Pickett to put up all 27 on his own, that's that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. No, I'm in agreement with you. That's going to be the formula tonight. And uh, before we get out of here, we're going to have to do a Bears uh, Patriots preview. Oh, wait, no, wait, we're out of time. Ah! Oh, oh, man. I had so many, I had so many cogent thoughts. I had so let's many. Do again. Let's do the pregame for, for tomorrow night's game. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of deep thoughts. I've really broken down the film. Um, it's bad, folks. It's bad. And you know what? That's okay. I mean, of all the years, we just talked for the last hour about NFL parody, and this is a this is a teed up season. This is a Matt Nagy special right here, where the Bears would actually be really competitive. Uh, you know what I mean? Like they would kind of be a little bit of a fool's gold and compete. But you know what? The next month is going to be really tough for the Chicago Bears. And I'm just saying to you right now, Mark. You know, we're a week seven right now. I'm looking at like week ten, week eleven after Thanksgiving, right? I don't really care what happens over the next month, except keep Justin Fields happy and healthy. But at around week 11, I am going to start really kind of objectively making some determinations about whether – because at some point you have to flash enough. At some point, I don't care how bad your offensive weapons are. You do have to carry your team at times and be the best offensive player on the field if you want to become what we all hope is a franchise quarterback in Chicago. He has to show us that. So if there's like 11 games left in the season, you got to give me like three or four where I go, okay, I can see this with blah, blah, X, Y, and Z around it. Let me give you two quick thoughts before we sign up, uh, sign off here. Steelers have to win tonight because they have the Eagles in week eight. Going to yep. be absolutely brutal. So this is why tonight's a must-win game against the Dolphins. And then I think the Bears have a chance on Monday Night Football if Justin Fields can figure out how to throw the ball to himself. <laughs> Ooh. Like a Burt a Bert Wonderstone situation, or this is like a prestige. This is a prestige thing. I know how he. I know how he does it, Mark. He uses a double. That's how he does it. And with that Michael Caine impression, this is where I'm at as a Bears fan. This is where I'm at. All I can do is just do Michael Caine impressions. Uh, we gotta get gotta get out of here. You guys gotta watch the national anthem, Steelers Dolphins tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for Jake uh, Ellen Bogan for coming on. Check yeah. out Believe in Rams and Downtown Rams all year. Great to connect with him. He's a great follow on Twitter. Make sure you, you check that out. Also, great follow on Twitter at Believe Sports at Believe Network. Mark throughout your socials. M D Bergen M D B E R G I N. Check us out. Believe in Steelers. We'll be back. Uh, tomorrow with some analysis from tonight's game, Joey. And Joey, thanks to the Joey Sports guy, the best, the best in all Chicago media, the very best. <laughs> uh, a, a titan, a quiet titan in a forest. But uh, no, I, man, I appreciate that, dude. Um, I love doing this with you, man. It's such a blast. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, this was the Believe NFL live stream. This was week seven, post game style. We hear every single Sunday at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern to always give you the reaction to the day's action ahead because Believe Sports Network, we have 32 NFL podcasts paired with 32 former NFL players and co-hosts matching them that are so wildly and talented. And we feature that every single week right here on the Believe live stream. So thank you so much for checking out this one. Uh, go Steelers. Go Bears. Go Swifty fans. It's been a good weekend for y'all. And go North Carolina State Fair. <laughs> Got to support the team. <laughs> Be well, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, comment, question below. We'll see you next week.